is um, the team from, or some of, the team from Bullfrog Productions, of course. So uh, please say hi to Glenn Corpse, Alex Trowers, and Sean Cooper. Right. Now, um, you three, um, I haven't seen out on the circuit too many times. We've just spoken to Sensible Software. I've seen them before. So do you do this kind of thing very much, or, or not? Is this a first for any of you? I, I get occasionally asked to talk about um, old stuff. Alex does it. Actually, yeah, yeah, I, I more, do a lot more of this. I do it a fair. I kind of dine out on the dopes. It's, kind of, <laughs> it's the only thing that kind of keeps me going these days. So, but yeah, Chris has been on at me to actually come down and, and do one for him at one of these events for quite some time now, and I kind of run out of reasons to say no. Yeah. Also, I really like the sound of my own voice. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sean's kind of had a life for the last 10 years, so he's not been doing this. Well, I've been, um, I've been running the business with my wife, mm -hmm. Stella, uh, and also producing some kids. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think making games and uh, bringing up children go hand in hand, because it's a hugely stressful. I probably spend 18 hours a day getting my head into it. I've just got back right. into it and I'm spending most of my time writing, so it's quite time cons consumption. Okay, so um, Bullfrog, of course, were based in Guildford, founded in 87 by Peter Molyneux and Les Edgar. Um, so how did you all kind of up there, uh, end up there, sorry? Well, I, I was actually the first employee of Bullfrog by a contrived argument of the fact that I didn't work for the parent company, Taurus. Um, there was about four or five guys who did. Um, and they were doing uh, a database and a cab package for the Amiga, and they hired me. I went in there, <laughs> I lost my job, my first programming job, and um, got made redundant because for a company making telex machines. Mm -hmm. nobody, nobody was even using telex machines in 87, so. Um, and uh, and the, uh, I, I just hung around in the local game shop. I knew a guy that went in there all the time and had an Amiga jacket, I thought it was quite cool. And he used to bullshit about all the cool stuff they were doing. And um, eventually I made him get me an interview, and I, after talking to Peter for about two hours, it transpired that they didn't need to have any programming vacancies anyway, so I started as an artist. Yeah, I was going to say you yeah. were programming operating systems where you were on telex machines and became an artist, so how, yeah, how well, did that Yeah, yeah well, cause I, just because I'd been playing, because, you know, I'd been playing around with art packages on the ST, and he sat me in front of d and said, draw a bit of wood, and, I, and he said, I couldn't draw that, we need an artist, you've got a job, you know, and then... It was the, that was and then the day after the big storm in '87 it was my first day in the office, and nobody who was actually turned up who was in the office knew I'd even been hired. Because <laughs> Peter hadn't turned up, and, uh, <laughs> and so um, yeah, so and, uh, yeah, I eventually got back into programming a couple of years later. Yeah, I um, the um, the government used to run a uh, YTS game. I don't know if they do anymore. Um, and I was on an iTech. You have to explain what YTS stands for. <laughs> a youth a youth training scheme. And I, I left my job as a, I was sketching some stuff in architecture, and um, I was on this YTS. I was I was just under the age of 18, so um, which, which was the legal limit. Uh, I think it was the legal age that you mm -hmm. that you can go on a YTS to. And 16 Pete, to 18. I right? think it was yeah. And then um, so I was a couple of months shy of that, and then Peter Molyneux walked in, and he's. Um, well, this is the story he gave me, and um, you know, you know what he's like. Um, <laughs> um, we're about to find out. Yeah, um, and I, he said, "I want your best guy," um, and they gave they gave him me. Um, I'm not sure that was true, but he made me feel brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, and I was employee number what three, something like that. Something, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so I knew <laughs> I knew Glenn from the game shop that he was talking about. I didn't have the Amiga jacket. Um, and I knew Sean from the bus because I was like one year behind him in the same YTS scheme. Um, and uh, so the really good thing about the YTS scheme is exactly like Sean was saying, uh, they would get local businesses, they'd come in and they would take you on work placement. And you know, at, at that sort of time, if you were that age and didn't really have any qualifications, there was gold dust. And I was at this place and they were really, really nice, really, really good. Um, and I met Sean on the bus, and he said, come in, we're always looking for people. And so uh, I went in, and um, I met Peter, and we got on really well. And he said, when can you start? And I said, well, give me two weeks to square it with the other guys, because they've been really, really good to me. And he said, oh, that sounds really good. So I went back to the other guys and said, look, there's this thing. Because I, I used to bunk off school to play Populous. 
Um, I, had, I had a mate, he had an ST, and I'd go around to his house when we should have been doing, I don't know what we should have been doing, but it wasn't that. Um, so I, I knew a bullfrog and I, I knew them, and so I was very excited, and I was saying, look, this games, this is really interesting, this is something I want to do. And they were sad to see me go, but they said, okay. And so on the Monday I turned up, went in the office, sat down at my desk, and eventually Peter kind of comes in and goes, what the fuck are you doing here? I never offered you the job. And, uh, um, and it's true, he hasn't. He's just got a very interesting way of, of, of making you believe things that aren't necessarily true. So I spent like six months on the dole um, until eventually, and every now and again, every couple of weekends, he'd call me up and say, look, we've got um, some journalists coming in. Can you come in and play the games? Or, and so on and so forth. And then, uh, yeah, about six months later, he called me up and said, look, you're really enthusiastic. Do you still want that job? And I went, yes, please. And that was it. Wow. And you're not, you're not the only person with the story of, I thought I had a job, so I turned up, yeah. are you? <laughs> there are people at Lionhead at the same thing. I've heard those, yeah. Get it in writing, people. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sean, you uh, came into computers at a fairly early age. I believe you found one, a BBC macro in a box at school and then ended up with one at home and started, to, was it teaching yourself programming? How, how did you pick that up? How did you find that out? I've got my sources. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Um, I saw them when I was 11, I think. Um, it was just before it was coming out, and I was in Cyprus. And I, I, just, fell in, I just fell in love with it, you know, just watching it do its, you know, r r running the demo on it. And um, so I spent a little, little bit of time playing games, and I quickly realized I didn't actually like playing games. I actually preferred to make my own and play those <coughs> instead, because then I could win. <laughs> quicker, um, and I think that um, that was—I mean—that was a great. The BBC B was a was a great introduction system to um, to coding for me. So you say you didn't like playing games. Were you a games tester when you first went to Bullfrog? No, we were. Def we were. Yes, I guess it was. Uh, we. I, I kind of guess started off as a tester. He, Peter, made me draw something yeah, like like that. Glenn, and then um, and then. Glenn taught me to program. Peter sat on top of me, pro helping me program. A guy called Kevin Donkin also helped me sort of progress my knowledge of um, 68,000, mostly on the Amiga. And um, then one day Peter just spoke to me, hey, do you want to take over this game? And you know, I haven't, I haven't really looked back from that point. And what was great about those flood, if anyone remembers. Yeah, flood. And and what was great about those days was was for me was that we worked as a, a very tight team and you know the knowledge base that was in the room and I was only 17 18 to be offered that you know from a from a bunch of guys that were really testing the the edges of these machines um, so I, that gave me such a, a, a very you know because I, I didn't go to university so it's so it was very much um, I was being taught by experts Right. And I learned very quickly. And were you the youngest there at the time? Um, uh, I think, uh, yeah. yeah, I think so. Um, and I think I was the youngest to write a game, right? That's yeah. about right. Well, you, yeah. You know, written Flood, flood yeah. 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 Yeah, that's the, yeah. I, I think like, part of the reason it was a tight team is out of necessity. It like, had to be, because there were like eight people. When I joined, there was eight of us. And it was a, uh, an office that was probably as long as these three tables here square. Um, so you just you had to get on with the people because you're literally sitting in their lap, in some cases. Yeah, me and Glenn. They, yeah, yeah, they, we, 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 used to, we used to we, cut the blows. They get off the my chair. chair. We sat back to back, and we didn't have there was and we literally we had this, we were sharing the same space behind our desks, so we were regularly just banging into it. And, uh, yeah. and uh, the, the times I can. <laughs> my, my desk was a fish well. tank. My first desk was a fish tank. I'm not stop. making up, it was a fish tank um, with just a bit yeah, of wood put on the yeah. top of it with, with Peter's chair in my back. Um, in fact, I always got the shitty desks because even when we moved to the nice office, I had a filing cabinet. And, I, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not making this up. I didn't, I didn't have a chair. There weren't enough chairs. But Peter was renovating his house and he was upgrading his toilet. <laughs> So while he was waiting for his old toilet to get taken out, this shiny new toilet was in the office for some reason. No, that was, that was my chair. That was, that was, that was his high-tech Japanese techno toilet. That he, oh, that it's he, still a bloody that toilet! He, that he brought back from the first trip and it took him about four years to plumb in. I was on that thing for like a month. So, so um, you say you're working as a tight team, um, and the name Peter's come up a few times, so how was Peter Molyneux and how was working with Peter Molyneux? 
Um, <laughs> he, he taught me more about programming than any, than than anyone else, and it's it's quite difficult to actually remember exactly what he was like as a you know how much he did how much. How much? It's, it's very easy to take shots at Peter. We could stand here and we could fill the next two hours with Peter sucks, Peter this, Peter that, right? Um, he taught me a lot about design. A lot. Some of it was what not to do, but an awful lot of design. And he taught me a lot about Actually, sorry, presentation. Something which people, people won't know because of, other, because of some of Peter's flaws. Alex was the detail guy on most of Peter's games. He worked not not the first few. And, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, like Peter, so Peter would go, hey, if, there, if there's a second design, if there's a second designer that should have any credit at Bullfrog, it's Alex. But there was all Bullfrog games say designed by Bullfrog, which is a quite a clever move by by Peter. But um, but uh, but yeah, if anyone deserves specific design credit for Bullfrog games. Alex over no not over Peter but after Peter yeah definitely I paid Glenn a lot of money up no. until this point <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, like you did learn an awful lot from him um, he was an incredible personality and up until what two years ago I would say there is nobody nobody better in the industry at selling a concept of a game than Peter right and and it's just because he never says no it's a real double-edged sword working with him because on the one hand the, the press love you, everyone is really, really excited about whatever it is you'll be working on next. The difficulty is that you never know what it is that you're actually doing until you've read about it in the media. Because you wouldn't know, like, we would, we would get these magazines, he'd have gone off to some show and he'd have done some interview with, with like, Login or, or, you know, Amiga Power or something, and you'd be reading this stuff going, oh, yeah, yeah, really, really cool. And then you'd get to a bit and you go, hang on, it's got, to, it's got to do what? It's got to have how many players? It's got to work on what systems? How are we going to, how are we going to do this? Why did you say yes to that? And you'd just be uh, like, yeah, whatever. I, I, think, um, I think when it comes to Peter Molyneux, you may see a very bad picture of him in the press, but he, I have to say he's a very magical guy. Yeah. And when <coughs> I, was, I was completely inspired by everything he said, I didn't care whether it was bullshit or not. Um, it, it just it just didn't matter. Um, you, you come out buzzing, would, don't you? you yeah, just... I think, and I, and I still hear it today. When 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 I mention something from a game perspective, people go, "Oh, is that feasible?" It doesn't matter because you're selling the you're selling the idea of something. It may be ambitious, but you're selling the idea and you're selling it internally and externally. And he did that magically. Absolutely magically, and, and I remember so many times sat in a room with him, and he would suggest something that was off the wall, that would then spark into a bunch of real, real design decisions that we could then march, march forward with. So, like, I mean, I think I think the, the biggest possible example of this of people not getting it, not seeing it, was for the first few games, and indeed for almost all of the games that we made, um, but certainly the early ones. Everybody bought into it. Everybody would play it. Everybody would work in towards this thing. And as we got bigger and started doing more and more projects, you'd still have this, we want to make a game about this. And then everyone gets excited. And, hey, wouldn't it be cool if this and that? And the first game, I can remember Peter coming in and saying, I want to make a game that does... And we all kind of looked around and went, that doesn't sound like fun at all. What are you doing? Are you mad? We don't believe in that. We, don't, we want to work on these other exciting things. And he was like, no, 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 no. I'm going to make this thing. It'll be brilliant. And we didn't believe it. And it was theme park. <laughs> and and it's, we just didn't get the concept. We were like, this doesn't sound interesting, because we were doing like Magic Carpet and Syndicate and stuff like that at the time, and stuff was blowing up and we were shooting things, and it's all really exciting, and he wants to make this game about queuing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he completely 100% proved this wrong. Yeah, and I, and I think he invent. I mean, if you think about Theme Park, I mean, if you look at all the, the games that are online, like Flash Games, Farmville, those kind of things, they all stem from that, that initial kind of vision of managing that kind of world. Yeah. You know. um, Alex mentioned earlier about Peter never saying no, and there's a story online about Peter when he was at Taurus, and a uh, Commodore invited him to Germany, and um, they believed he had uh, a networking system for Amigas, but they'd invited the wrong company, Taurus. But he, he didn't tell them they invited the wrong company. He got the free Amigas anyway. <laughs> I think one of them is in my dad's ass. <laughs> yeah, we had we had an Amiga with a serial number zero 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 six on an Amiga one thousand. I wish I'd managed to grab that because yeah. the time when no one would have cared. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Those things ended up in skips or sold off for five quid at an auction, didn't they? Um, uh, 
I mean, I, I worked with Peter from the, the, the before these guys, but, um, and, and I and I just started as an artist. And one of the things that struck me about him is that I was sort of I'd been programming on and off on ZX eighty ones and Amstrad CPCs, and then the Atari ST over you know over the, the years before I started working. I, I never actually released anything because I didn't I didn't realise I knew enough to release anything until I started working at, working at Bullfrog. And the interesting thing was that Peter, although he was a good programmer and he and he, he did some incredible things the, the, just simple things like the idea that the, that the screen was memory were alien to him and that and I think that was a strength you know that he you know he worked above that line when you know, at, a, at a time when all the people who'd come up through the eight bits were you know were, were rummaging around with machine code and stuff but then we went on to write you know after writing um, the first few games in a mixture of C and the little bits of assembler from me we went on to use pure assembler, which is insane for Powermonger and Populous yeah, Two, yeah. and like, um, and he did all that work. And he, the other thing that Peter did, which I find hard to, rem just hard to reconcile, is that we finished Populous, and I, I was playing around with the engine for Powermonger, and during that time he ported the entire thing on his own with a tiny bit of help from me on the, for the graphic formats to PC. It's just a bloody nightmare in those mm. days. Mm. I mean, and, and um, I think, although he did have Rob Rob Hubbard's help for the music, I think that was possibly the only th yeah. the only thing that was ever released on on a uh, with his well, the, well, maybe the first thing on PC. But, um, yeah, but like us, Glenn. Yeah. Sorry, like, I mean, like like Glenn and, and and I and the other people that were that, that were joining us, um, Peter was completely determined to make this thing a massive success. And you know, he, he's made us a success as well. And we, I mean, really, we can only thank him for it, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, but the games were not built by him. You know, they're, they're, they were built by teams. You know, that yeah. we put together. And speaking of which, just a, a couple of years in, then you had a <coughs> massive success with Populous, and I believe you all worked on it. I think Glenn, you were co-creator. Uh, well, you guys, no, yeah, uh, my, no. uh, Populous too. Yeah, the I'm, Populous. Was... I'm on the credits for testing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, no, Populous started. I'd done a couple of games as an artist, and then uh, Peter had sort of we both the first two games, which were a port of Druid Two from C64 to Amiga, and then a game called Fusion that we did. Um, they hadn't made any money. They'd not got hadn't got close to paying the wages of the people that made them. And Peter had gone back to work on to to work on the CAD package. He was adding a programming language to a CAD package. Just kind of stuff he was doing amazing <laughs> programming and and uh, um, I I hadn't been given anything to do and I was thinking shit my, you know this job isn't going to last much longer so I bought my ST in and started I, I initially started trying to port fusion to it which in which became apparent very quickly wasn't going to happen because it couldn't horizontally scroll enough so then I got sidetracked into trying to do the isometric blocks from spin disease Sort of just to get the block set going, and then I, well, I got them rendering. And I thought oh, I haven't got any data for it, so I made this thing that generated a sheet of the blocks together. And that, that was the populous, you know, the original populous demo. And it was just speculatively, what are we going to do with, you know, I didn't, we didn't know what it was for. I was, it was, I think it was an August bank holiday. I'm pretty sure it was an August bank holiday. I had nothing better to do, and I spent three days writing that. And on the Tuesday morning, showed it to people. I said, what are we going to do with this? And Peter sort of, it was almost like. Chitty chitty bang bang. He went off, you know, as soon as I got it working on the Amiga, he went off into the other room and came back with a game of these little blocks of people moving around on it. Because we didn't, you know, I had no idea what it was going to be used for. You know. But, um, so, yeah, it was just, that was, uh, it was a real, it was, yeah. But the game is, the game is his. It was just, it was just, just kind of weird luck that it, that it all came out, you know, from, you know, <laughs> if the ST had been at a scroll better, I probably, it probably never would have happened, mm. you know. Populous two, and also Powermonger. Can you talk Power about some of the, the, two, yeah. the differences in the games, behind the games, the production of, of those, and why, why you felt you needed those three games? Well, Populous, like I say, was speculatively developed. Powermonger was planned, kind of, <laughs> and from the, uh, planned as much as any for game gets. Yeah, <laughs> but, for, but because I was writing it while Pete was doing the port of the Amiga version. Instead of it being based on three days of prototype work, it was based on four or five months, and it had like a polygon renderer with sort of textury, what well, was dither patterns and stuff. It was quite, quite nice. 
was, you shouldn't really be trying to get an ST or an Amiga to do that sort of 3D. It doesn't really work. But it was, it was, an, it was just a fun experiment for me. And then, and then, um, but Peter almost went mad putting the game in that, didn't he? And like I say, we were, it was written in, written in, in, in pure 68,000 assembler, and there was no game there for far too late. And then he did the thing, locking himself in a room and, and uh, you know. Found it. Uh, and wor worrying his family. Sort of. there, was, there, it was, there was some really cool stuff in it. And again, the, the, the bits that he was really, really interested in, i.e. the background simulation, the fact that you could pick one guy and you could follow him and he would go and he would have a life and he would live in a house and he would work in a field and he would marry this person and da, 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 until you came along and then swept him up in your army and sent him off to war. All of that stuff was absolutely incredible. And it, it uh, he's got a couple of kind of common traits that run through a lot of his game. And, one of them is the kind of voyeuristic aspect. The if I stop playing, the game doesn't. The game just carries on. You can sit there and you can watch it. And they did that really, really well. But then the flip side is, and he has like loads and loads of ideas, but with zero filter. It, you know, it's everything is this is an idea, this is an idea, this is an idea, and there's no pause to go. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Um, and so I, I think that, you know, if I was to go back and if we were to redo Powermonger, which is in essence one of the first RTSs ever made. Um, then all I would do is get rid of the carry pigeons, do that, and you'd have a much better game. And, and it's just the, the idea that he wanted this background simulation so that you could have these commanders all over the place that you've recruited, and this is your main guy, this is you in the game, but that guy's over there, and if you want to tell him to do something, this guy has to send a carry pigeon, which takes bloody ages to get there, and then he'll go and do the thing. So it's like playing with a ping of two and a half minutes, you know. Yeah, I just don't think he could visualise the game. Um, you know, I don't think he had a, a strong vision because if you look at all all the other Bullfrog games that that he was there seeing them through, he he would at least share in the vision or or if not create it like you know theme park and dungeon keeper etc. And so, can you talk a bit about uh, some of the platforms you were developing games for? You say or oh, really beta tended to disappear and put something on PC, but. What were the three of you uh, developing games for, and what, what kind of dev units were you working on? It was, it was Amiga for us at the start, except for Glenn, who was a real devotee of the ST and used to get very, very def uh, defensive well, well, no, about it. Not so much, <laughs> no, it wasn't, about it's not again. defensive about it. It's, <laughs> I was the only person that ever touched the ST in mm. Bullfrog. No, I mean, no, you know, um, and so, so, you know, my, my, so. Popular started off on the ST and became, I, and I, I really can't remember how we did this, it became cross-platform very simply, way back then, you know, we had this thing running with two different C compilers, and, by, and you know, mixing with pure assembler on two different platforms, and it was multiplayer across those two platforms, and, and I can't remember how we did that, you know, to this day, because multi-platform stuff's still an issue now, you know, but, um, and, but yeah, it was... It was all Amiga first, and then the ST was just a, sec a secondary concern, you know, for me. And then by the by, Populous Two, that was I was working on the Amiga. You know, there was there actually sort of got to look at the Blitter manual a bit, and you know that's that's why it runs about twice as fast as Populous One on an Amiga. Um, whereas whereas the Populous One arguably is kind of you know the ST version running on the Amiga. I mean, and um, with, the, with the palette stolen from Dungeon Master and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but Syndicate was the first PC lead platform. The first time we actually well, it wasn't. It wasn't it? No, it wasn't quite because I was just going to come on to that. The um, I started the just as on the tail end of Powermaker, <laughs> we started Syndicate on the Amiga. Yeah, yeah. No, but it was the first one that we actually and well released yeah, first on PC. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And and we so we wrote this this whole system in, on the Amiga, and then it was Peter's decision. We're going to move to the two eight six, which was a a 16-bit machine as well uh, so I had to learn 286 and then he said oh no we're going to move to the 386 now because the tech was coming in quick and so we moved to 386 which I think went up to 32 bits at that point right we just we got on the um got on the 32-bit bandwagon very early yeah so the really yeah so the, so then we had 32 bits and then that opened up that just opened up the, the floodgates really for me is when I mean, we could do a ton of stuff very quickly using you know 32 bits, and then I think we actually launched it under 386, um, so it wasn't quite 486 at that point. So it went through quite a transition, well, then, and then it went back to Amiga, uh, yeah. to it was ported onto the Amiga, onto the SNES, and then Mega Drive. Mm -hmm. But you know, 
Yeah, basically, before before that point, PC programming was a pain in the ass with segmented registers and all that yeah. stuff. On, and it was only it was I mean things when Doom came out that was probably 32-bit, and there was a few other things with 32-bit. You know, but we luck we just we were lucky to move to PC at the right time where you could you could choose to make that that uh, step. And, and that was it was kind of cool because Bullfrog did manage to shift from being an Amiga to a PC um, focused. Uh, <coughs> Studio, studio, and be quite successful on both, which is, was quite rare at the time because usually it seemed like each time there was a new generation of hardware, a new generation of developers turned up. So that was, we were quite happy that we managed to actually achieve that. And so you mentioned Syndicate there, obviously. I know Alex, you you worked on it a lot, but uh, I presume all of you have some involvement with it. Well, I guess it. I, it it's, it's what I. These two guys. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, I I call it my baby because mm -hmm. it's. Uh, I was I was uh, when it came out. I was 22. Um, we spent me and Alex spent pretty much three years developing it, not knowing what we're doing. Um, I still had a lack of knowledge. I was only 22, uneducated really although I'd learned how to program um, and you know we, we had a good partnership uh, me being the the programmer and the and, and the kind of lead and we had some great artists come on board that could, could fill in everything Alex Alex could take all the you know all the nitty-gritty detail and the design and the, uh, and the level design um, in fact he handled all of that um, and we had some very competent programmers pro, pro, programming out the front ends. Who had the initial idea for the game? I th we, it was we, all of us. We did it on a pub, yeah. We it saw was, it was Pizza Hut, wasn't it? We were in Pizza yeah. Hut that time and we were just chatting about what... Well, I mean, like, because you had the, the, the cyber assault thing prior to that, but the, when we moved to the PC and got going in earnest, we had a, a meeting in a Pizza Hut. <coughs> And we knew we wanted the agents and we wanted the Living Breathing City ETM, speaking to the kind of voyeuristic thing before. Um, and that was about it. And we were interested in, like Paul was really interested in the kind of cybernetics aspect yeah. of it. Yeah. <coughs> and, and it I, just kind of grew from there, didn't it? Yeah, I think that the, um, I, I think the, the key thing was that we got slightly drunk. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then I think decisions could be made. And we walked, we walked away kind of <coughs> thinking of an idea that we had. And I think, you know, just coming back to Peter again, this is where he comes in. I spent a lot of time, we spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, things like... Um, he definitely invented the persuader drum. No, but I think talking about what, what Alex was talking about earlier, about power monger and the living, breathing kind of thing, that he was, he was thinking about that the whole time. These guys go to work. You know, they, they, they go home, um, they get on the train, they get in their car. We didn't quite achieve all that because we had you know, limitation of technology, but that's that was his big thinking. You know, because he didn't have to do it, so so he can think. No, but but I think you need that. I I always think you need a big. There, there needs to be something bigger than that than, than the thing you can actually implement. Because you can always bring you can, you can always come mm -hmm. down to it. Mm -hmm. and shoot, shoot for the moon. Measure. Shoot for the yeah. moon. If you hit the horizon, you're doing all right. Yeah. But I think I think the reason why. And certainly the reason why I remember Syndicate so fondly, like you said, it was a huge part of our lives then. But I think one of the reasons why it's still fondly remembered as a very, very good Bullfrog game is because the way we would develop it would be like, of a Friday night, we would go down the pub, we'd have a few drinks with our mates, and, you know, they didn't work at Bullfrog. And then we would go back to the office after the pub closed on a Friday to play Syndicate. And, all weekend. And, and we would play it, and it would be multiplayer, yeah, literally we would all play it. And then, and then we'd and go, hey, wouldn't it be cool if this? Wouldn't it be cool if that? And the children would go, all right, give us 15 minutes. And you'd go away and you'd write the new thing. Right, new version's up. Everybody get this. And we'd play it like that. And it was incredible. And then somebody would realise, it's light outside. Why is it light outside? Oh, it's Sunday. Ah, OK, we should go home then. And those were just brilliant. My, I mean, my personal favourite one of those was the night we put the Gauss gun in. Yeah. Now, I'd spec'd out a Gauss gun because they were all going to be these cybernetic guys. And the Gauss gun was originally a weapon that was going to... Uh, do lots of damage to artificial things, to cyborgs, but not much damage to humans. And we hadn't implemented it, and no one was really interested in it, but we had this spare icon sitting there. And Sean goes, I'm going to put a rocket launcher in, and he makes this thing, this insane rocket launcher. Call but of course, gun. yeah, and, and that was just because that was the icon that we had left over, so it became that as a sort of placeholder thing, but it stuck. But the thing is, this was happening at like 2 a.m. on a Friday, or on a Saturday morning, and it was just me, Sean, and a couple of our mates in the office, so no one else knew about it. Come the Monday, when we would normally have our, like, like lunchtime, everybody start playing the game. 
nobody would buy the weapon because they didn't know it existed or did anything except for me we and did. Sean. And the screams from the other side of the office, like, what the in hell's just happened there? It was brilliant. That, uh, that was probably my favourite bit of the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had the luxury of, I mean, I was only vaguely involved in Syndicate. I mean, I think Alex probably doesn't even remember this, but I used to, because I used to be an artist on some of the earlier stuff, and then we sort of hired, I was, I'm just not good enough. I, the last game I did the art on was Populous, and um, so after that, I couldn't sort of have art as a second thing to do when I was busy programming. And during Syndicate, I was working on all the 3D rendering stuff that became Magic Carpet. Cover sprite. Yeah. So I ended. So I ended. No, I didn't do any of that. No, I wasn't involved with any of the programs. No, no, I wasn't involved Glenn, with the programs Glenn, at Glenn, all. Glenn, but you, but you were, you were the inspiration <laughs> okay, no, no, behind was, the engine yeah, was, for. That something. was one conversation from some dodgy ST thing I knocked up a few years earlier. What I'm trying to say is, I did actually design six of the levels. It's too modest. Yeah, and so I was, I was involved, but I was, I was sitting next to Sean, you know, sort of happily, you know. Right, rising 3D rendering stuff and experimenting with exciting bite per pixel modes on, on the PC. On the PC. Uh, so I just, I was sort of just watching all this stuff. The, the problem know? is Sean's a sponge. Yeah. He just sits there and yeah. you don't think he's paying attention, yeah. and then he goes away and just does exactly what you've done. <laughs> so I would go. Like, how do you know how to do that? Yeah. Well, you literally just did it. And we still sit. We still sit next <laughs> next to each other. Just a couple of hundred miles away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. The Skype does it now. Yeah. No, you, you mentioned, uh, Alex, just briefly, the long-lasting appeal of Syndicate, and Peter described it as the heyday of Bullfrog. Would you all agree with that, or do you all have a personal favourite? Personally, yeah. Um, it, 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 it was certainly my heyday. It was certainly the, the most inspiring um, time of my life. And it's the time I look back on, and I go... I love that. Time. It's all downhill. From if, that. if you look, no, I'm <laughs> still going up. Different. You know, yes. It's just different. You know. mm -hmm. If you look, if I you was look pushing back, thirty by then, so I'm, if, if, I, I, I prefer the app. I've got some fond, fond friends. I mean, yeah. I mean, we. I met a lot of people in that time, and and you know, I love those guys, and and they all help me out today. You know, so when we when we have a problem with something, we can always phone them up, and I think that's where we established the biggest relationships in our. In our careers. From a from a pure like game dev perspective as well, um, if you speak to any game dev about whatever game they've just made, right, and they put it out the door and they've shipped it, and if you ask them, do you want a game? They'll say no. They will not play a game that they've just finished because they've spent however many years doing it through all of this rubbish and they've just got it through Sir and they've just got it released and it's incredibly hard to do. Syndicate was the exception. We still played Syndicate after we launched it, and the only reason we stopped playing Syndicate was because somebody released Doom. <laughs> um, oh, that's kind of cool. And we swapped and we started playing yeah. that instead. Yeah. But that was it. That's what it took to get us to stop How long playing. were you working on Syndicate? Years, wasn't it? I think it was three years. It was approximately three years. I mean, we, we got off to a slow start. So the first... Sorry. So the first, um, the first, I would say, 18 months was a learning how to, learning how to do this big thing that we're about to go into. And then... And then we got. I think. I, I think it was the net bias that really changed, really changed the uh, the landscape for us because we managed to get good multiplayer mm. in, and we got things moving around. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point because Syndicate didn't even ship with multiplayer. It was no. a dev, it was a dev tool. Yeah, but that's, but the data disk had the multiplayer. Yeah, but, yeah, but it only didn't ship because EA couldn't get it working. NetBIOS working on their yeah. network, wasn't it? Well, it didn't. It only worked on a LAN as well because yeah, no, we, we, we hadn't worked out how, how to absorb the ping at that point. No, but we but, cut it. We, we yeah, yeah, no, it was done on yeah. We we we, 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 we actually cut the whole. Um, I think it was it was four days. It it was come. It had to go into QA. So they were testing it and testing it, and then I pulled the plug on it and said. Well, we're not going to put it in, and it, and it was a little bit of a hassle because they had actually printed it, printed some of the stuff on the box. Um, well, the des, you know the designs and stuff, um, and they had to make a change on that. But they couldn't. We just couldn't. We just couldn't get it through. It, it, it does. It does upset me that the vast majority of people who have played Syndicate haven't played it multiplayer. Haven't played it how it's meant to be played because a lot of people have obviously played it on the Amiga and there was no multiplayer on that. And to get the multiplayer on the PC, you had to get the data disk, and not very many people got the data disk, because to be honest with you, the data disk wasn't that good. Um, and you had to be playing it on a LAN, because, yeah, because if you tried to do it over... Nobody had a LAN. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the internet but, didn't exist. I mean, it's one of the things that probably people don't know, is that Populous, Syndicate, and Magic Carpet were all multiplayer first. 
those games were all multiplayer first and none, nobody really played the multiplayer. I mean, Populous was multiplayer because it, we just had a serial cable dangling between an SD and an Amiga that we'd used, the that we'd used for stunt, initially, we, initially we'd used it for stunt car racer okay. and then we used it for um, transferring files between, <coughs> between the two machines before we got, before DOS to DOS came out for the Amiga. And, um, and uh, you know, if, if that hadn't just been laying around, sort of, tying our machines together, we probably wouldn't have put multiplayer in Populous either. But it was really fundamental because until about three weeks, four weeks before the end, there wasn't really a game in it other than the multiplayer. I mean, and, and me and what we used to do is we used to work all day. This is before these guys' time, so I can tell you, make up anything for this. We, we, we used to work all, until about... Work. Work until about seven in the evening, and then, and then we'd play it multi... Me and Peter would play the game multiplayer until about ten, and then go to the pub for the last hour and talk about the game and then go back in the next... And that was like a cycle for, you know, not for that long because it, only, it was only seven months for the entire development. For maybe a, for maybe a month, that was, that was how the computer opponent was, was written because, we'd, we, you know, we'd, um, we'd play it multiplayer then he'd, then he'd basically try and, try and get, the, get the computer opponent to beat me the next day, you know, and that, that was so... The whole, I, you know, I kind of was all of the testing. For for, um, for for the original populace, really, but other than the final QA. You know, um. So you've talked about your um, Amiga, PC, and uh, an SC platforms. Who did all the ports, though? Because obviously your games appeared all over the place. Uh, many people are. after we had, after we had teams entered, so so we we would tend to. That's where I'd become as a producer for the for, you know for the credits. Populous was all done out of the house. Oh, I see. Like, a, lot, I, a lot of the populous ports were done by. I was thinking later. Done by Imagineer in Japan. Uh, and um, oh, there's, I'm going to name check John Cook. I mean, John, oh, yeah. John Cook yeah. went around the world and um, and uh, and basically got developers to, to to port it to different platforms. And sometimes you'd have to get a different publisher and, and stuff. And at one point, um, I think it was probably been when Populous Two was in development. I was the Game Boy. The Game Boy had been released, and I'd. I mocked up, uh, just for my own amusement, a 160 by 144, four shade of yellowy grey version of what Populous might look like. And I showed it to John when he was in the office one day, and he said, put that on a disc. And he put it on a disc, and I should have bought this, it would have been a great thing to bring. And then um, a, few, a few weeks later he came in, and he'd, so he'd got somebody to write a piece of software that just displayed that, these two screens, I don't know, two, two screens. And you press the A button, and it would toggle between them on a real Game Boy. And had an EEPROM hanging out the back, and he went off to Japan with it, and then the, it did get ported to the Game Boy, where it's virtually unplayable because as soon as more than about ten people are born, the frame rate drops to about one frame a second, and it, I've actually finished the first level on it. It took about two hours. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's not. It really isn't playable, but it's it's shipped on the Game Boy, is, and um, and it, that was and that happened because because I said, oh John, look at this, and he said, put it on a disc. <laughs> Which is, yeah. yeah. So that and and popular ended up on about twenty platforms. It's on. It's on. I mean, it was virtually a launch title for the SNES, or it was in, a launch. In, uh, in Japan, the, it was a, one of the first six. One of the first six, you know, and it was, um, which is slightly embarrassing because nobody remembers it as a SNES game. No, 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 the SNES version was it's brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, I know. Yeah. On the, on yeah. the pad, were fantastic. But, um, <coughs> but yeah. So, that, so in that that. In the case of Populous, they were all done out of house except for the PC version, which Peter did, and um, and the SD and Amiga versions were both the original because it was it was just cross-platform development. But later on, they tended to be done in they, that all changed, and uh, well, it was individual. And, and, and also for SD for for Fusion, Flood, uh, um, they I I I ported those two. That was my job. So the Syndicate took um, three years, you were saying you were working on it, um, and you're working on some other fairly deep and involved games, and I believe there was some concern that you just needed to get a game out, and you did one in six weeks. Which, uh, uh, yeah, we were all running, involved with that. running out there. Chris, Chris kind of warned <laughs> that, that that was coming up. Do you want to, do you want to start? You can, see, you can see it running out, running out there. Um, you can. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let these guys talk about it, because I didn't actually work on it. But the thing was... Distance. The thing was, well, it was, it was built out of the Dungeon Keeper engine insanely, and it, that, that was my contribution. I was... I was able to relax uh, for, for that period of it, so and, and just well, watch these guys. <laughs> except it was your also your prototype three D model thing because we didn't really have a system for that yet, and you'd made that weird little yeah, three D thing. Was I, I wasn't doing much of the work on that. I was doing other stuff. Yeah. Well, I I think I can tell you the true story. It was um, EA 
I think it was, it must have been um, March or April, they had no no um, products coming out in the in the drive window for the end of the of the end of the quarter, so that would have been up till June. This was like months after Bullfrog had been bought by EA. So, so Peter was over in the in the states or Canada, you know, talking to the Worldwide Steering Committee, and they challenged him to save their their empty quarter by by releasing one of the games that were in development early, which would have been Magic Carpet, Dun Dungeon Keeper. Nothing was anywhere near ready. Yeah, so I think I think there was a couple of suggestions. There was a fighting game, an RPG, and I stood up very, very, very bluntly and said, uh, "I think we can do a driving game within that time." And I think what's amazing to that whole process is that EA and Bullfrog started the game and had it in the shops within eight weeks. So it took us six and a half weeks to actually develop the game. But I think if you if you look at the EA, the engine behind it. For them to get it into the shops and have the promotions up and running was absolutely phenomenal. And to get it through QA as well, it was just... I remember Peter coming in in the morning and he, he shook me because it was because I'd been there all night. And he said, has it gone to QA yet? No. Get it to QA. You know, and I just went, oh, it's ready. And, uh, and then we sent it off and, you know, that was it. And I think it was six and a half weeks. I think it was six weeks and three days. It, it, it was crazy because again, you know, we we didn't build it from scratch. We had an engine and we had like the multiplayer tech and we built it straight up as a multiplayer first thing. So, you know, because again, like, that's the way we'd always kind of worked. Um, we took lots of shortcuts. So there were no wheels because we didn't know how to do wheels. Um, and we thought that would cause problems. <laughs> but the, the one that the one that always gets people, and just recently, there's this there's this. Don't uh, give it away, Alex. Yeah, Don't it's it. all no, no, out. There. Everybody it's knows. Out there. Everybody. I'm going to do it. Keep the illusion. I'm going to do it. No. I'm doing it. <laughs> but I'm, uh, but the only reason I'm doing it is because it, this bit is responsible for my most popular tweet that I've ever had. So I'm really pleased with that. So there's this um, Australian game designer called Jennifer Sherlock, and she tweeted out relatively recently, "Hey, does anybody have any kind of hidden game design mechanics for games?" And I popped up with the fact that in high octane, when you pick your vehicle, you see all of the different stats for acceleration and speed and armor and what have you. Um, and you pick the vehicle, so there's a big truck that's really big and heavy and a bike that's really fast, or that thing's got really good acceleration. And under the hood, they're all exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, this is because... Oh, well, it, it's because we needed to balance the thing, and I'm, I, well, I'm certain. I'm certain we intended to put those stats in at some point. <laughs> no, we didn't. But we, we did not. <laughs> we did not. In fact, I'm trying, Mike, to, I'm trying Mike, to dig us out of this. Mike Mann, when I told him, he said these cars need different stats. I said, we're not doing that. We haven't got time. And he started almost crying. <laughs> I could see this tear develop in the corner of his eye. And I'm sure you were with him, Alex, yeah, and yeah. I'm sure you were probably crying as well. But there was no, no way the computer opponents would have got rid no, of the exactly. track. But it makes <laughs> perfect sense. <laughs> <And> the, <laughs> the amazing thing is that 20 years later, you'll still get people swearing that the... the, 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 the yeah, reviews. The gaps that the trucks can't... The collisions were the same. Everything was yeah. the same. <laughs> well, that this one is tough. On, on this track, you really want to pick this car. It needs a bike. Too yeah, much. exactly. And it was just... It was incredible. <laughs> the, the, the weirdest thing about High Octane though, is when it was about, I don't know, five weeks into development, it was everybody was playing it all lunchtime, wasn't it? Yeah. It was like an eight play there was it was, eight, eight, it was eight an eight player. player game going constantly every lunchtime, you know, for a week or two. And that wasn't because we were making people play it either. People no, were no. genuinely enjoying it. And at that time it was a very simple game. It was all about the handling and tight you know, because it would drift it was basically controls like an asteroid ship with a boost. You know, there's no it's not proper physics or anything. But you could sort of go into a hairpin and hit the boost at the right time and get really, you know, and it was just great to play like that. And um, and then what? Then I hate to sort of yeah, slag I'm Peter. I'm going, to, I'm going to say this because say Peter's not a driving game on, fan. Peter's on. not a driving game fan. He came in, played Alex, and said, "This is too hard. Just keep beating me too much." He wanted to randomise the thing with power ups and shooting and get the other player off, and it basically stopped everybody playing at multiplayer. Yeah. So the game was actually ruined by Peter. But I'm, I'm just... I mean, no, 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 I'm not... I'm not it's unfair, it's, me and Peter had already discussed it. Oh, yeah, OK. You know, we had already, already sat I'm, there I'm and only, discussed it. I'm only saying that it was, a, it, was, it, was, it was a lovely game for a little while. And I'm not, I'm not trying to slag Peter It wasn't very ac accessible. Peter didn't like driving the, games. It was, it was fine for us. It was fine for us. And like, like when... Yeah. And in fact, so Syndicate Early Doors, you had eight agents, not four. But the only people who could play that were me and Sean. 
and we made the decision fairly early on that look, no one else can handle this, we need to cut that right back. But it's the same sort of thing, Peter came in and said I want the car to be able to turn on the track. Uh, turn around within the width of the, the circuit, whereas yeah. before it would be impossible. It was just you would barrel it's around the thing, drifting around corners. Yeah. Uh, mm. But you imagine like, driving an well. asteroid ship through a through a maze. It was like it was like that. But it, it led to some really, there were almost like balletic things, like when you had the third person kind of replay cameras up high on the corners, you'd get everybody uh, stretching out on the, the straights, coming into the corners, and then there'd be this just huge kind of furball of all the cars <laughs> jostling for position in the corner until somebody manages to get pointing in the right direction and boost out <laughs> off the side. And it was, it was brilliant. And the way, because uh, you came up with the boost thing as well, and the way the boost thing worked was brilliant. Uh, you, you charged up the boost, and then you let go, and it killed all your momentum, and then speared you off in whatever direction you were then pointing it. And that was crucial to navigating the corners. Uh, but if you held it for too long, it would kick in automatically. So if you hold your boost down before you got to the corner too early, you'd hit the inside of the corner. If you did it too late, you'd just be stuck in the middle of the corner with everybody else slamming into you. So it was a real, there was a real skill to it, which I think was part of the problem. Um, the draw distances on it are quite short. It's quite foggy. Don't, no, that no, is, no, 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 That's my fault. Uh, is that a limitation of the Saturn, of the engine, or or something else? Well, it was... I th it's probably 20 blocks, the same as it was in Dungeon Keeper, and, which is a limitation of the PC, because obviously it's very tempting to say, oh, can you draw it a bit further? And like, you can, and the, the game that needs this criticism more than anything else is Magic Carpet, because it's only 16, I think. Um, <coughs> but each time you sort of double the distance, you quadruple the polygons, and it just, it, and, and you know this was 90 megahertz Pentiums, you know, rendering about a thousand textured and shaded polygons. It was in the ballpark of you know <coughs> of the state of the art, really. But, um, and because it was all made of the same size squares, that's how it had to work. And it's kind of insane in a way to use a, an engine from a game like Dungeon Keeper for a driving game. Because that, on that you can go anywhere you want, but why would you? I mean, most driving games are done with a, an engine that has a ribbon of track and a, and, and a system of working out which polygons, which bits of that are, 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 are visible from which other bits. <coughs> we couldn't take any of those shortcuts. We were just brute forcing all these polygons of this world through this thing. <coughs> it's amazing it worked at all, really. But you can see, when I mean, it came up against, by the time it hit the PlayStation, <coughs> A competitor, it's um, Wipeout, you know. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I need a drink. Oh, right, I'm fine, yeah. It always sounds like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every conference call includes a cough. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's fair to say Wipeout kicked our ass. <coughs> yeah. But, yeah. but the interesting thing I found... Not surprising. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the interesting thing I find about um, Magic Carpet was like at that point we had a we had a reputation amongst developers like they knew that we were the go-to guys for god games for these crazy simulations and world building and and no one would kind of touch us there and so there were some developers who they would be making flight sims or shoot em ups or things like that and they thought they were i don't know safe and then we released magic carpet and then suddenly we'd hear from these developers kind of going uh oh bullfrog's kind of moving over to our bit and you you would get messages from them being like you sure you want to make this sort of game? Or do you want to like go somewhere else? Don't get into our genre. We don't we don't want you there because we're scared. That kind of thing. What's the feeling we got? Yeah. So you all um, obviously were were coding at, at one time or another. You've done all done bits of QA and, don't, and don't testing me, and things. Don't let me. Don't ever put my code in a finished thing. Don't. <laughs> and Glenn, I don't know if you're aware, but you were described by Edge at one time as one of the most gifted coders working in the industry. So were you all happiest when you were? Getting your hands dirty, if you like, in code, or what do you mean was? <laughs> <laughs> well, when they said it, <laughs> oh, man, I, know. I was probably head of R and D and not doing much of it then. When, when, when they said it, actually, but, um, I imagine. Um, but no, I've been pro I've been programming ever since, and I probably would have been smarter to get out to get out of programming a bit more than I have done. But um, because I don't know, yeah, I've spent a lot of time doing the indie thing and trying to do it on my own, and then you suddenly realise that. Most of the programming of a, getting a, a game done is 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 a quite easy and b very boring and um, and and but but also very time consuming, incredibly time consuming. So uh, yeah, I shouldn't be working on my own. <laughs> that think, wasn't the question. I think um, I think just to add to, to add to Glenn, I think he, he's doing the same today as he was. 
then might not be putting as much energy into it, but <laughs> and it's because it's a bit easier um, with all that knowledge. Yes, it doesn't need to. Um, but I think it's it's um, I think from Glenn's perspective, the it's not just tech um, tech programming. It's it's a sort of creative a creative tech design. In the same way, you know, the guys at Doom did. They were very creative the way they created, created their engine. And it takes us, I think it takes a special type of person. So we we're quite lucky that we had, we had creatives as project leads. We had creatives as tech guys. We had creatives as design and creatives as art. So we had a very strong community. So talking about uh, gay men. I mean, I, got, I was really lucky because right at the time when I was playing around with the PC and like, it was just wonderful to get from the Amiga to the PC where you had a bike, was a pixel, and you could sort of start texture mapping and all that thing, all that stuff. And I just happened to be playing with that stuff right when people were first playing with that stuff. And I remember sort of seeing screenshots of Ultima Underworld and thinking, shit, how are they doing that? And, you know, and, and, and sort of, it's sort of you know, realising that, that Gurad shading, which is the first thing I did, that texture mapping is kind, kind of the same as doing that in 2D until you put perspective correction in and, and it's, it, it's all, it was all it was all very very interesting stuff and quite easy to sort of stay up with the state of the art on it back in the days of software rendering and then <clears throat> but that was all sort of blasted away when 3D hardware came along and suddenly you had to do things more standardized ways I mean Dungeon Keeper is interesting in a way because it was it's got a lot of weird custom technology just to get those pixels on the screen because you can do whatever you want to get the pixels on the screen. But all, all of that, and we had some even in, more insane versions of that. But they all got wiped out with the, you know, with having to support 3D hardware and just push triangles to the screen like everybody, like everybody has been for the last 25 years, you know. But, um, <clears throat> but that, then, then the creativity comes comes out in other places. So it's all, you know, it all sort of balances out. We mentioned earlier taking a game engine and using it for another game like High, High Octane. I believe you developed a, an underwater engine, and it was it you, uh, Sean? Same engine, same, same one. Was it? Uh, same, was it you that took it? Except this one was blue carpet. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, when I when I started playing around with the PC, the first thing I did is got a triangle renderer and then put Guru shading on it, so it was blue and it was underwater. And when I added the texture mapping, it was like this is all boringly blue, and it became this thing that turned into magic carpet but the the underwater version of the game was still sort of was still on the list of things we might want to do at bullfrog so it was when we, when we there's was, a lot of artists like that. <coughs> well yeah because, what, because, because paul mclaughlin was basically the art director of bullfrog from like no. way early on and he has a massive hard one for submarines so he really really wanted to do an underwater game despite like everyone at EA would be saying, no, underwater games don't sell, you can't do an underwater game. And he'd be like, no, 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 it's going to have submarines and we'd get really, really passionate and excited about submarines. And, and then Guy was on the project and he really, really liked dolphins. So those two were like, yeah, oh, this is going to be amazing. Yeah. You just reminded me, but there was um, me, Guy, Paul and Les Edgar and <laughs> Mark Huntley for some reason. We went on, a, on an expeditionary trip for, for, for creation, the underwater game. Um, we went up, we flew, up, this is the only time I've ever been to Scotland, embarrassingly, we flew up to, I think it was Dundee, then drove to Loch Ness, and got in a submarine and went down, in Loch and it was basically, uh, there was like, a, it had a Swatch logo on the side, it was there for a few years, it was a, a disused um, uh, repair craft for oil rigs, and when you get in it, it's totally pointless, you get in there, and there's, um, and it's, you can't see more than about six feet, and it goes down, and and, and we, were, we we yeah exactly perfect for the for the renderings that we had we had, and we were sat in the back of it, and this thing was I was sat there with Paul with his with his love of submarines and Guy, and I think Guy and Mark and Les and Mark were up the front looking out of this big sort of four, about four foot around circular lens, and it was going ping ping ping, and I and um, Paul said I wonder what that ping actually means, and I guess. Wouldn't it be funny if it was just a recording? And, I, and Paul asked the guy, and the guy said, "My brother made that on a synthesizer because because uh, because tourists keep on asking why doesn't it go ping?" <laughs> and then and then they, then they brought us back up to the top. They opened the hatch, and the pressure was released. And everyone's ears popped. It was bloody horrible. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's, that's, that's my, my creation anecdotes. Got nothing to do with the game, but.
Yeah, well, trying to, God knows why we did that, yeah, but sorry. it was a laugh. So I think um, I, I think I was in the room when I said that's rubbish um, to creation, and I think we killed it, didn't we? Didn't, it didn't, got, yeah. It got killed, and then um, I think I think Magic Carpet was spawned out of one of these moments of, guys, we need to make some money. We need, we really need to make some money again. And I don't. Glenn was mucking about with the landscape. Um, me and me and Paul were having loads of discussions well, about what we could do with it because Glenn yeah. had created this. Magic one, carpet. We, we called it the Enya Simulator. It was like, like it was all simulator. mountains and it was lush terrain, and you would just kind of fly over this thing, and there was nothing on it. It was just the, the landscape. You we were like, this is really too. relaxing. <laughs> and so I think me and Paul were coming up with this crazy stuff of. Um, there were balloons that you were going to go and there were going to be creatures sweeping across the plains and you were going to be like hunting them in these airships and stuff like that. All kind of steampunky wonderfulness. Um, and then I think Peter came in and went, let's get a guy on a magic carpet. And <coughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think he came back from, it, came back from E3 or whatever. Was, uh, absolutely the right choice. And said, and said, I know he came back and said, we need to do, you know, was... was, was that was kind of. It was also. Uh, it was also like, again, and from quite early on, I think there was a, a little bit of pressure from marketing types who, whenever we'd go to them with a game, they'd be like, I don't know what this is, I can't sell it. How do we sell this thing? Because it was weird and it was unusual and it, it refused to be pigeonholed. Um, and this is again at the time of your Sonics and your Marios and your Lara Crofts and your Crash Bandicoots or whatever. And we didn't have one of those. So I think the move, uh, there was some pressure to get us to put a bloody character in one of our games mm. that they could use as a, a, the marketing tempo. Yeah, be, and the thing about, for me, for and me... we went first person, so you don't see... Yeah, the yeah. yeah. but there was, there, there was a, guy on, a guy on a carpet yeah. standing there for a while. Uh, but I, I think for us as well, it was that... I'd written this up, but for me, I'd written this engine, which and it had like texture map guru shaded, you know, different bits bits of landscape blending together in a sort of this through this weird rule set that that me and Finn had thrashed out together, um, the artists who'd been working there when it was just the two of us working on it. And the one thing I knew about it is I didn't want it to be a flight simulator because I thought flight simulators were shit boring and all you, you know you just looked at a blue over a different shade of blue or maybe brown and then there would be a few dots and you could you could shoot them while they were still pixels or maybe you'd see one frame of it flying past. I thought there's no way that I'm wasting this on a bloody flight sim. So that so that was more a case of what do we what do we do then, you know? So we have to have an excuse for being down low and being able to see be, be close to the landscape and stuff. So yeah, and, and yeah. No, so I think I I mean to, to to finish the story we um um eventually Les Les came in, so I remember him coming in, and he said, we need to make some money. Yeah, I've been, I've been bugging about with it for about three years, on and off, <laughs> since he had a pocket too. And I just took it on, I said I'd do it, and uh, I think we'd spent about four and a half months, um, five months to the shop. So again, it was like, let's get, you know, get it done, and a bit like High Octane, although High Octane came after Magic Cup. Mm -hmm. So Sean, Sean took the engine that I've been... That's right. So basically what happened um, from this point on, this was definitely, I think, the project that established Sean's reputation as the closer. We, as Bullfrog, we're very creative, we're, let's do this, hey, what about this, what about and we got very easily sidetracked by a whole mess of stuff and we never actually finished anything. And Sean comes along and goes, stick it in a box and ship it. Here's the line in the sand, we go to this point, then we're done. Um, and then, so whenever there was a project that was even slightly getting in trouble, or it had been going for too long, or it was losing its direction, they'd parachute Sean in, and he would fix it and ship the bloody thing. <laughs> and it's also, again, I don't, I don't, people don't think I'm slagging Peter off. Peter was, during the time that Sean was working on Syndicate and Magic Carpet, Peter was working on Populous 2, Theme Park, and Dungeon Keeper. So, you know, Sean was basically the guy that, the guy that developed the, the Bullfrog titles that weren't Peter's thing. <coughs> and Peter was very much, very much mostly focused on his game at any of those given times, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, it's not unfair poke, to say that. He'd poke the other ones with a stick every now and again. Yeah, and you, he, yeah, he kept track of them, but he didn't. He wasn't really involved with the day-to-day -day design of them. And, and, but he did have instrumental observations and stuff, you know. Yeah, well, very, we had, very, yeah, yeah. We had me, you know, as a, as the head of the company and the, you know, the, the, the general manager of Bullfrog. That was his role. You know, me and Peter would have quite often have meetings uh, you know, over a coffee or just discuss it, you know, just discuss our findings of where we were and you'd always come up with something unusual. <laughs> so the 90s there were lots of changes at Bullfrog.
founders leaving, um, I believe Glenn yourself, was it, you, you left to go to the US for a short while, is that right? Um, well, I went to London first. Uh, I went to London and then I ended up in, I, end, I came back to Electronic Arts this time, so yeah. I bought it. Mm -hmm. And then um, they flew me off to um, Redwood Shores because I, I, I guess I wanted to see more. Um, and I thought the Americans were producing better games. Why were they producing better games? Um, so I went to go and have a look. I spent a couple of years out there doing um, The Godfather and working on James Bond to see how, see how that all went together. So did your feelings as, as Bullfrog employees, have they changed by that time? Did you think it had reached a, a natural conclusion or did everything change all of a sudden when, you know, it, maybe it, Peter it, left? It did or? change. It, uh, I mean, it, for me, it was um, Peter had lost, he'd let go of his baby basically, so he'd given this, he'd given this business away to, um, to, to EA. And the way that I saw it, the, the way that I saw it, that he, he wasn't the same, he wasn't the same person to me. Mm -hmm. And 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 also, I had this dying need to see what was over the sea, you know, what was on the other side, because I'd only seen it from one perspective. And I was looking at all these other games, and I was thinking, you were young I, when you started. yeah, and I want to see some of those. So I was I was 25 when Mark Lewis threw his keys at me, his M3 BMW, and said, please stay. I said, I've already made, I've already signed the contract, and I, and I was gone. And you, you came back as well, did, but Peter had gone by then. Would, would you have come back if Peter was still there? I, I think I came back because he had left, and I, and I knew that I knew that, with the, uh, that, that there was a new dawn coming. Um, so I think this, we probably fell out of some, we probably had a disagreement or something. I, it's really foggy what I remember, but I, I do remember kind of, the, the company as the studio Bullfrog lost lost its focus a little bit. It lost its identity, basically, mm -hmm. and and identity. I, th I, I think there's two twofold. Mm -hmm. And Glenn, you yourself left and, and well, started Lost Toys. Was I it? left I left quite quite late. Ninety nine. Uh, been, been and gone. Uh, we're back by that by then. Yeah. yeah but, but the um. <clears throat> but one of the things that happened when P Peter left Bullfrog, sort of short. I don't know. Um, Sort of four years after the EA, the three years after the it was just EA after buyout, Keeper won, won uh, released. after Dungeon Keeper had been released, he and he set up he set up Lionhead to do his, um, you know, and you know he got the first couple of games were you know, aimed at EA. I'm not sure exactly how, how all that worked out, but but by that at that point, Mucky Foot had already been created and people had left, and um, then obviously another whole load of people had left for Lionhead, which was never was now a thing. And um, I remember there being there was an article in um, Edge where they interviewed the re they interviewed six of us about the um, about Bullfrog without Peter, you know. And uh, I said some of the same things I've been saying here, which is like, well, he wasn't really that involved in Syndicate or Magic Carpet anyway. But, and it really uh, he, we fell out over that for a long time, which, which I think is very unfair because he bloody left the company. You know, he left the company, and the, the the first question that Edge asked us is. Aren't you guys fucked with our Peter? You know, and like, so, so what, what am I going to say? You know, <laughs> yes, you know. Yeah. But, 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 um, but it, it turns out we were, but we were, but not for the reasons you might imagine. I think it's because EA didn't really realise what he did exactly. They didn't we we lost the champion. We lost yeah. the person who was in EA who was fighting our corner. Yeah. And, and we, did, we didn't lose anything creative. Well, we lost something creatively, yeah. but not to any extent that you would notice in the games. But we lost that voice, that figurehead. The focal point, and and the other thing is like, when you're working on a game, you do kind of need to be focused, and you need to have your complete focus on this thing. And he was a lightning rod, and so any any like criticisms or any any bad stuff would just get stuck to him, and he would take it all and insulate the team from that. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have that, so suddenly we're now dealing with marketing. We're yeah. now dealing with. Yeah, but, I, but I, I personally think that's we had a prop. We, we had, had to do that. It we, had to we had to. We had a weakness. So when I when I came back. There was a where Peter had gone. There was a massive revamp. That's where people like Colin Robinson came in from Mitsubishi um, and started to manage the company as as the EA producer. And the EA producer owned the product and therefore communicated much better with marketing. Uh, and and slowly we evolved into this in, into this group of people that actually spoke outwardly to the to the big EA 
engine. Mm-hmm. And I think you need you need them all when when you're writing a game. It's not just the game. Yeah. Now, Alex, uh, you ended up at Lost Toys with Glenn. Uh, were you poached? Um, no, because again, you know, I took the I took the changes in Bullfrog very hard um, because again, you know, it, it felt like my baby, it felt like my thing, and I'd grown up with this thing. And that's not to say that EA are bad. EA are not bad. They're really not. And if you get to work for them in that environment, the stuff they do as a community, as a as a culture, it is actually fantastic there. But it's just Bullfrog was, was better. Um, in, in, from a social aspect, from a, just a couple of guys having a laugh aspect, it was brilliant. But it had to grow up, and I didn't want to do that. And so I went to see um, Glenn and, and Jeremy and Darren and that, and they were showing me the stuff that they were going to be doing as Lost Toys. Um, and they said, you know, this is kind of what we want to do. Are you interested? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I'm kind of interested in that. And then I went away, and I went back to went back to Bullfrog and handed in my notice and then I get this really panicked phone call from Glenn going, I hear you've just left, what are you doing, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm coming to work for you. <laughs> so in a, in, a, in a complete reversal of what happened know. before, they had actually offered me the job and I hadn't let them know that I'd accepted it. Right. No, okay. right, yeah. <laughs> um, but, sorry, I was, I was, oh God, there was something that was... No, I think look, when Peter left, he, 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 they didn't appreciate, appreciate what he did and the main thing that he did is is empower people like Sean and, and me and Alex to, to do what we do, do what we were good at. And when they re, they were sort of because they didn't know exactly what to replace him with, they replaced him with lots of with people from different from different companies with other experiences, and it really changed the flavour of the company in a way that had never happened before, you know, in one go. So, um, but it's not. It's, there, were, well, there, there were several there were several major cultural shifts throughout the the course of Bullfrog's thing. When we went from like the eight people to the 20 people in the office, it was all right. Mm. And then uh, one in the space of a, a couple of months when we hired <coughs> the first wave of graduates, we suddenly pulled in like 40 odd people who knew no one knew in mm. one big go. Yeah. And that was a massive schism in the yeah. culture. Yeah. Um, and then we did it again a little later on with like another huge swathe of new really great <coughs> people. And some of these people are absolutely amazing. But it was just that kind of we don't know who you are or, or what you've done, and we haven't had any opportunity to get to know you. And it kind of broke everything up. It's not Bullfrog Bef- anymore. Before Peter left, well, it was still Bullfrog. It just yeah. it was different Bullfrog. It was, it? Before Peter left, I don't think there was anybody in a position of management that hadn't worked their way up there. Yeah. That's pretty true. And, and, uh, and as Peter left, they brought in. You know, I I found myself interviewing my own. You know, my own boss. You know. <laughs> I was head of R and D. I was interviewing somebody who was applying for CTO, yeah. and I've got nothing against the guy. We were working with him now, yeah. you call it, you know. But um, but but uh, you know, and he became he was studio head for EA for a while. But like the, but but um, the, the change, you know, it did suddenly seem like the, the culture had changed in such a way, and that was happening right at the same time. That you'd be going down the pub and the mucky foot guys would be down there and the lion head guys would be and down there. Essentially, if yeah. you look at if you look at mucky foot, if you look at lion head, if you look at lost toys, it's just a bunch of ex bullfroggers mm. trying to go back to the glory days. That's all it was. That's what I was going to ask. And when you yourself went to lost toys, did it recapture the old days of bullfrog or the yeah. dynamic completely? Uh, no, no, it, 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 it was the same. Um, I guess the difference was that you, you're then having to build the name from scratch. You don't have that cachet. Um, and I think Monkey Foot struggled with it maybe slightly less than we did. I think they were a bit more bullish than we were about you know them and their heritage. Lionhead didn't have to worry about that at all because obviously they had, they had Peter and everything. But yeah, um, we were always trying to recapture the stuff that that we each thought made Bullfrog what it was. Um, and um, again, thankfully in. Lost Toys, we had some people there who were dedicated to, actually this needs to run as a company. Somebody's got to do, like, I, I, I always used to rail against the idea of producers. What does a producer do? You know, well, he's, he's, not, he's not actually contributing, he's not doing anything. That's a big, bald-faced lie. What a producer does is he makes sure everybody else can do all of that stuff. And you don't need a producer, but what you do need is everybody filling the roles that the producer does, and not everybody wants to do that. Um, so those things still need to get done, and they need to get either be done by a bespoke person or somebody else. And Lost Toys, it was kind of largely distributed, except for one guy who would take on this mantle of, of, of producer as well. And you need that; you have to have that. 
it took me a very, very long time to realise that. Um, now, Glenn, at, at last time you did a game that I must admit I'm uh, not aware of. It was not no one is. Aquila, and you were quoted as saying it's the best thing you've ever worked on. Was that a bit of fluff, or is that? No, I mean, funnily enough, I was looking at a rev some reviews of it the other day, and like, it's really a, the, 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 the the movie stuff is so appalling that I feel embarrassed about saying that. You, you have to you have but, to watch the cutscenes with the sound off. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's terrible. It's utterly, utterly and like, appalling. And like, if, if, if Alex had made the script a little tiny bit funnier I, or, I, more, I, or I, dumber, Darren, it, would, it, would, it would be, you know, you could look at it and say, oh, they're taking the piss, yeah. but it's not quite... It it's quite, played straight. Yeah, it's the whole just, sort of like, oh. I bet you've got a good view of the wall so behind in, your desk. Thing. In the same way, it's, in it's the same way it's like, I get really frustrated with game I designers. I love the game. With game designers who come up and say, I've got a great idea for a game design, and then they tell you a story. Yeah. They tell you the, the, the backstory and the lore and everything. I'm like, that's not a game design, that's a story. Yeah. Um, games, and especially these days, I've got a real beer in my bonnet about the more ludic approach. You know, it's something that you play, it's something that you, you do. But the experience of it and the story and the narrative is also important if the game needs it. And if it does need it, for God's sake, get someone in who knows how to do it. <laughs> Don't, yeah, don't just no. hand it to the yeah. don't just hand it to the guy who goes. Oh, I think I could write a story. I could bang out some dialogue. No, you can't. Are you a writer? No, don't do it. Yeah, yeah. Get a writer in. Get a writer in early. Let them do their thing. Be, yeah. be interesting because Battle Engine Aquila was very much Alex Alex's design and my based on my. To, I, I was responsible for some of the tech, but it wasn't really hinging on it in the way that the early Bullfrog stuff did. It was just some cool, just some interesting stuff, but. The, my take on what that game was was that, that you know you've got these this big war going on, but there's these two sides fighting each other, and you go in and swing the ball balance in favour of your side. Now that problem with that as a USP is that we were doing that for real. We had, the game actually was it was like it was like an RTS that was, or something that were, you were, was being viewed from a first person camera of this battle engine that could morph between a tank thing and a flying thing. You know, fighting the thing, and and the war would go on without you. I mean, we, you, some of the levels will literally just put the stuff down, and they fight each other based on AI, no scripting or anything, just a completely simulated. And and, it, and but the problem with it is that loads of games describe that as what your, uh, you know, our USP was something that you can just write down, and nobody's going to argue with you. I mean, the, our big competition was Halo, which came out about a month before. And that was their description of what you're doing in the game, you know. And it didn't matter that we would have 50 tanks, where they could only draw two, because their tanks looked 50 times better, you know. And like the fact that, that it wasn't really the free game that it appeared, that those big beach levels with the cliffs behind them were basically just quake levels with funny-shaped <laughs> corridors. And we were doing this simulation of a five-kilometre by five-kilometre island. But, but I mean, like the, re uh, the reason Battle, fi um, Battle Engine kind of existed is we were finishing off... The other game, so we did this other one called Moho, um, and Glenn, for as long as I can remember, has been talking about this game idea he's had in his head for a thing called Mob Rule, uh, yeah. and and he was like, I want to make Mob Rule, and we were like, excellent, all right, we're going to do that next. We'll finish this off. You take the next couple of weeks and you go away and you prototype Mob Rule for us, and then we'll all jump onto that as soon as we finish this. And then two weeks go, and we come back to Glenn and go, where's this game? And he shows us this hype field engine, and it's like, you've written a hype field engine. Okay, what's the game? I don't really know. Okay, well we have to use this Highfield engine, what game are we going to put on it? And that's how we started this whole thing. And the, the, the idea of like the mobs and the, the lots and lots of units sweeping over this battlefield, that's where that all kind of came from. But then, so, just to rope Sean in here, I can remember when, uh, I think I came up to visit you, uh, uh, EA Chertsey one time, and that's where you introduced me to the phrase, which I think is incredibly relevant here, cosmetic combat. Because you were talking about doing, I think it was going to be for a, like a new desert strike, urban strike thing, where again we would it would place you in the middle of a massive combat situation, oh. but it would all be orchestrated to make it look like then the shells would just hit and it would be dynamic and it would feel really really tense without actually ever kind of threatening you. And that is a lot easier to sell and a lot easier to kind of produce than this. We'll throw them all in a pot and hopefully it'll work, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. But that's the first time I ever heard the phrase. Cosmetic combat. Yeah. Okay. We can take uh, a few questions from the audience if anyone wants to ask anything. Stick your hands up. Uh, Alex and Sean, were you involved in Syndicate Wars at all? Was that something you had any? No, I was no. Slight, 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 slight producer. Uh, 
slight producer role, but not too much involvement because we were on magic carpet. That was G-Mores then? We, G-Mores, that's G-Mores. right, yeah, G-Mores. As it was your baby, what did you, as the original was your baby, what did you make of what happened to it? It wasn't as good, was it? <laughs> 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 At least it was a bit like Syndicate, not like, unlike the, uh, yeah. the more recent remake. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, at least it shared the same kind of camera view and, and, yeah. and stuff like that. I didn't, I didn't particularly get on with it. I didn't have a chance to play it that much because we were we're way busy. too busy on this other one. Um, but I think it, I think it kind of lost something. It moved quite arcadey. It was less about. I was always into Syndicate for the. You go over here, cover that corner. You go here, do this. You bring up the rear with a, a big weapon. Just la 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 la. Whereas. Syndicate Wars was very much, here's my army of guys, I am awesome, running around shooting big lasers. Um, and so it wasn't... I think, um, I, I think to be fair to I mean, I, I say it wasn't as good, it's just... Um, they didn't buy enough people in the company into it, I think. You know, they didn't get the same traction as what Syndicate did. You know, everybody in the office was playing that multiplayer at some point, and I... I just think that adds, adds tremendous value into the design. The company must have been well over twice the size by the yeah. then as well. But it's very important to get... It's very hard to work on a game that you're not into. So it's very hard... It, it, if everyone buys into it, the game will be better because that's when you get the best conversations. And the best conversations are all the ones that start with, hey, wouldn't it be cool if... Yeah. And you're only going to get that if you've just tried playing and gone, oh, that sparked something, that. What if we can get in the car? What if the car will explode? What if the car can fly? What if the car has lasers? What if, you know, and it snowballs from there? I think more importantly is when they say, oh, that's shit, because, and then you fix it, you know, and, and it changes. Uh-oh. Here we go. When did you, when did you all st- start making games? I, I, I started messing about with games um, from the first time I got a computer, but I was, I was nearly 17 the first time I saw a computer because I'm so old. So, so I, I, I missed out on the chance to learn when I was a kid. It's, got, it's one of the weird things about uh, is that I, I mean I, we didn't start I didn't start working in computer computer games till the Amiga, and I like, I was 23 and I know so many people that are like four years younger than me have been working in the industry for four years longer because they started when they were 15 you know or 14 or whatever. It's just, it's really weird. <laughs> it makes me feel up. Like, well, made me to be feeling old for, for 30 years now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, like, my first professional role of making computer games was this, but at the YTS, where I was before, um, I used to make games for the other students, because I'd finished my assignments, because let's be honest, they were a bit rubbish, right? It was They were trying to teach us how to type, and they were trying to teach us how to program in basic, and they just weren't very good. Uh, and so I'd do all of those, and then I'd just make games and be passing these discs around the, the other students. Um, and I got pulled up by the supervisor who told me, what are you doing? Stop doing that. You'll never make any money making games. And then about six months after I'd started at Bullfrog, I bumped into her um, in a shop. And I was like, oh, hey, how's it going? You know, what are you doing now? And I said, oh, I'm working at, I'm working at Bullfrog. I'm making games for a living. Oh, brilliant. I said, well, how about you? Oh, I got made redundant. I'm on the dole now. I'm not... You know, and then the whole the system had collapsed. And she'd been out on a limb, and there I was making games for a living. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, prior to that, prior to computers and everything, we used to make board games all the time. Like uh, me and my dad and my brother, we would just get a big sheet of paper, we'd start marking out a set of rules, we'd start marking out a board, and away we'd go, and we'd just make stuff up on the fly. But that's you know, that was my introduction to making games before getting into actually realising that you can do it as a career, which was a real eye-opener. Uh, any other questions? Anyone want to ask oh, yeah, a question? Go on, you can shout. Yeah. Um, Flood, what was the inspiration for the ending of Flood? <laughs> Lack of space, I think. <laughs> Lack of time? <laughs> time. No, I just thought it'd be funny. Yeah. <laughs> Don't run, be run over. <laughs> Spoilers! <Yeah. laughs> any more? <laughs> Anyone else got, uh, got a question? Oh, should we let these fine gentlemen go? I think they've uh, spent quite long enough with us. You've got one guy. Oh, go on. Uh, it's just for Glenn, really. The step change that happened... No, 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 we've finished now. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once companies like uh, ACI and NVIDIA started coming along and you had to start writing specifically for their accelerators, how, how different was that from what you were doing before? Uh, it, it's not that different, really, because back, 
originally you were just getting into draw triangles, so you so you weren't sort of forced to do anything their way. And then by the time you were forced to do it their way, it was so powerful that you could do so much cool stuff. I mean, it's just it, it, you just got to accept the fact that that's the quickest way to get stuff on screen, and there's no other way around it. But um, it, I, I'd love to sort of see what we're, the world where 3D accelerators were never never invented, and people just kept driving those bytes with cut with CPU code. What kind of because we had weird curved renderers and and strange strange little things that did hard coded polygon shapes that could draw seven thousand polys on a pen, Pentium, Pentium ninety, and that all those things die because because they become irrelevant. You know? I, I think my favourite bit of your kind of software rendery stuff was the fact that in Magic Carpet, it's got 3D modes. And I don't just mean it's a 3D engine. I mean, it's got uh, the red and blue mode. It's got the the LCD shutter mode. It's got uh, the it Magic Eye different... mode, which only Glenn can see. <laughs> Magic, Magic Carpet supports two different VR headsets from the, from the old days. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for spending uh, so long with us. Uh, Glenn Cox, Alex Carroll, and Sean Cooper, thank you very much.